Greetings from CNS and welcome to this special episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development, a new CNS series which, is pre which presents insightful and thought-provoking interviews from leaders to help uh, accelerate the progress to achieve Agenda 2030. Uh, one of the targets of Agenda 2030 is to end AIDS and also to end tuberculosis by 2030 and we have just 133 months left to do that. Are we on track? Let us know more from our special guest today on site from Africa's biggest AIDS conference, ICASA 2019, the 20th International Conference on AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Infections in Africa, which is being held in Kigali. We are very fortunate to have with us today Professor Linda Gale Becker, Deputy Director, Desmond Tutu HIV Center, at the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine, University of Cape Town, South Africa. And she's also Chief Operating Officer of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Linda has also been a past president of International AIDS Society. Welcome, Linda. Uh, what is the future of HIV AIDS? Well, we hope it's um, starting to diminish around the world, but it isn't all good news. Uh, there are sadly still parts of the world where HIV incidence is actually on the increase. Um, and then many parts of the world where it is either plateaued out or is just not reducing fast enough for us to meet the targets we want to meet. So the future could look very bright, but that means we all have to uh, roll up our sleeves and get working because there's a lot to do. Why are we failing and why? by way of uh, not being able to prevent new HIV infections as much as we want them to. I believe there were 1.1 million in Africa itself. And, uh, yes, so in, um, correct, in 2018 we had um, 1.7 million yeah, overall, infections yes. overall. Yes. Um, and 75% of those occur in this part of the world. So it is pretty extraordinary. You know, I think we've done really well on treatment in this part of the world. We've, we've, we, we have not met the targets, but we are sitting in the high 80s in terms of the numbers of people who need to be tested um, and the, the sort of mid 70s for the numbers of people who need to be on treatment. Um, so I think we're doing relatively well on the treatment front. And there have been some modeling studies to suggest that if you treat well enough and enough people are virally suppressed, that incidence will then just naturally go down because we will transmit fewer infections. But in fact, that isn't happening and we haven't realized that because it, you know, we just aren't where we need to be. So we have to employ primary prevention as well. And that means we have to get the tools that are at our evidence-based tools, like pre-exposure prophylaxis, have to be rolled up, rolled out and scaled up across the world. We need really a lot more um, penetration of prevention into every single part of the world that needs it. Yeah, so very often it's about translating science and research into public health gains, actually. And this is what has happened in the case of PrEP also, I think. Uh, the rollout is not as, maybe, as good as was expected. And still we say treatment is prevention. So what, according to you, can be done or what are the main impediments in the rollout of PrEP, maybe in the context of South Africa also? You can so I'm pleased to say South Africa is just about to launch their major scale-up. So it will, in 2020, this intervention will be available in every single primary health care facility in South Africa. So we're rolling out to 3,800 primary health care clinics. Um, and the idea there is to get pre-exposure prophylaxis as close as possible to as many people who need it. So I think that will make a significant um, impact. When we look at cities that have done this, that have had good uptake of treatment and really rolled out pre-exposure prophylaxis, we are beginning to see the, the, you know, the end of AIDS in those cities. So provinces like New South Wales in Australia, London, uh, Amsterdam, these cities where there has been a nice combination of treatment treatment as prevention and pre-exposure prophylaxis, we actually are seeing infections disappear. So that 
is really the lesson for all of us. Yeah, but uh, again, uh, the low bar the low income countries, low and middle income countries, I think, are the places where we need more. Yes, and sadly for us in LMICs is the this difficult, you know, financial question of do we treat everyone or do we provide prevention? And, and it becomes a, you know, a case of prioritization and rationing. I think the only way around this is to say it cannot be either or, it has to be both. And donor, you know, donor and other funding is going to have to come to the to the fore in that regard if for us to be able to do it. In addition, we need to drive the prices of these uh, treatments as well as the health systems have to be, you know, organised to be able to give them out. So all of that is very important. And then, Shoba, we should not forget that we still have to eliminate mother-to-child prevention. And I do think. Sadly, PMTCT has been pushed a little bit to the side, and yet we have not completely eradicated mother-to-child transmission, nor have we reached every single child who needs treatment in the world today. And that, to me, is just poor investment and bad strategy. The one aspect of this epidemic that we should be concentrating all of our efforts is is making sure that no woman... uh, you know, transmits virus to a child unnecessarily. And that wherever possible, we find those children in whom there has been breakthrough infection and get them onto treatment as soon as possible. And I think that's not a very high hanging fruit also, just to uh, target women and just ensure that uh, that infection doesn't go to the next generation. Correct. And, you know, I think we did such a good job in the global plan to end mother-to-child transmission, but we never finished the book. You know, it's one of those incredible things in public health where we've, we, we wrote, you know, three quarters of the book very, very well, and then completely forgot to end it you know and that seems to me just a tragedy in the making so you know I think as as every single level of society all the way from government leaders to civil society on the ground needs to recommit to prevention of mother to child transmission. And another very alarming fact Linda is to my mind that still so many people living with HIV They are living longer lives, but they are dying of tuberculosis. And um, I think there were 250,000 TB-related deaths in 2018. Uh, What needs to be done to prevent uh, people with HIV at least not succumb to TB? And how to also ensure that the latent TB in them does not develop into active disease? Well, and of course, the other thing that we've just failed to do is to get rid of tuberculosis in general. In general. I mean, if there was no TB, then people living with HIV would not have to worry about TB. And we seem to, you know, it's the biggest killer in the world today, communicable disease killer. And yet we are so complacent about TB. I hardly, you know, even to, we, even though we've had high-level meetings and, and many efforts to get it into the public, you know, conscience... It, it still seems to be something we're so incredibly complacent about. So there's no doubt that, um, you know, we need to redouble our efforts to say it is not okay that there is this much tuberculosis in people with or without HIV. And patently, those people who live with HIV are at the mercy of tuberculosis, it, you know, with, with, a, with a damaged immune system. Even on ARVs, we know people are still more susceptible to tuberculosis. So I think awareness, I think early diagnosis, um, IPT is obviously, INH prevention therapy has been shown to be useful. Um, and, you know, making sure that individuals who live with HIV get onto their ARVs as soon as possible, get their immune systems back up, and make sure that they're living full and healthy lives, we're going to see less tuberculosis in those individuals. It's what we are finding in South Africa now is that it's the individuals who are, for whatever reason, giving up their antiretrovirals, mm-hmm. taking a holiday or cycling out of care, is, sorry, in, I'm interrupting. Is that happening now? That's then? definitely happening. And then people are coming back into hospital now very sick with both HIV and TB. That's because we have a very high, like India, mm-hmm. we have a very high force of TB infection. Mm-hmm. 
So if you're off your antiretrovirals, if your CD4 starts to drop, you're a sitting canary for tuberculosis. And that's what unfortunately is bringing people back into our wards. So we're starting to see this kind of recycled individual coming back into into hospitals and wards um, accordingly. So is it because uh, they are becoming more complacent about the HIV treatment uh, given that means it said yes it is not um, curable but it is treatable and you can live lives as you are saying that they are missing uh, opting out of ARBs and then getting back into it yeah you know I think it's a tough thing to ask someone to take treatment for the rest of their lives and I and I think what is happening is not in every individual but in a number of individuals there's pull fatigue Mm -hmm. they're taking a break Mm -hmm. they are you know cycling what we call cycling out of care for a time and that's when they become very um you know very susceptible to tuberculosis so you know the message there is talk to your clinician talk to your provider think about some other way that maybe you could take a break the good news is we are about to see injectables come um, Mm -hmm. onto the Mm -hmm. onto the forefront Mm -hmm. obviously costing is going to be an important player there Mm -hmm. but that may be an option for people who are just tired of taking pills that they could take a a monthly injectable um, and get their treatment that way Uh, Back to tuberculosis in people with HIV, I think South Africa has taken a lead as far as uh, uh, TB preventive treatment therapy is concerned and uh, a lot many people have been put on uh, TPT. It's been slow. Um, It's for some reason... it's, it seems to be quite a difficult thing to do in our current health systems and, yes. and it's not entirely understood why. Mm-hmm. Um, I think again asking people to take yet more treatment on top of the treatment they're already taking mm-hmm. and for how long. Mm-hmm. We know that the IPT protects while people are actually taking the mm-hmm. INH. Mm-hmm. When they come off the INH then again they're unprotected and so you know it's a hepatotoxic drug mm-hmm. um, so that it's not perfect let's put it that way and and so I think there's a combination of healthcare providers not pushing hard and maybe you know patients not being putting themselves in that position there's no doubt that of the choices we need to do getting people onto their ARVs and making sure that they stay on their ARVs and they're fully suppressed on their ARVs is more important than anything else mm-hmm then the addition of IPT becomes an important other thing to do, but it should never be at the expense of getting people onto antiretrovirals. We know that the antiretrovirals are life-saving and immune-saving, and so that's critical. On the TB side, again, we can be doing other things like reducing uh, exposure, uh, which means we need to get earlier diagnosis in those who are TB diseased, make sure that they're on their TB treatment, you know, that um, our clinics are are good, at, uh, well taken care of in t- terms of infection control. So there are a number of measures that we need to be paying attention to. And then, of course, integration yes. of HIV and TB care is important from the client's point of view. Mm-hmm. So people are more likely to take their ARVs and their TB therapy if the treatments talk to each other, if they're aligned. So on the day I come to fetch my ARVs, it would be good if I could pick up my TB treatment at the same time. Um, You know, obviously having a healthcare system that makes it easier for for patients to get their care is one of the very important parts of making sure people stay in care and suppressed. Mm -hmm. And we now have shorter treatment regimens also for latent TB infection. Uh, so do you think that would help? Uh, some countries are rolling it out rather than the six-month-long therapy, if it's just a one-month-long therapy, I think, with rifapentin. Uh, yeah, would I, you know, I think the innovations that are coming through, I mean, they've all been incremental improvements. I don't think we've yet had the game changer that, you know, if you could swallow one pill and be done, um, that that would make a big difference. Um, but I think these incremental changes do help. Um, and so, you know, clinicians should stay abreast of, of all the innovation that is going on. 
Um, and we've, of course, just had the union meeting in India. Um, so all the very latest data will be available on those uh, webcasts and so on. Um, and, of course, we all hold out hope for a TB vaccine. It's a very exciting yes. time to see that, you know, for the first time we have the potential of new TB candidate vaccines uh, that we really do need to move into, you know, confirmatory testing and then testing whether what we've seen in HIV negative people will hold out in HIV positive people so that we can get, you know, moving, cracking with, with vaccines as well. Uh, anything else you would like to share, Linda? Any out-of-the-box approaches you would suggest to end the epidemic of AIDS? Yeah, I think we have got some game changes on the way. Um, you know, we talk about take your pills. We are now talking about a monthly pill to prevent yes. HIV. So that's going into phase two. Um, very excitingly, there's a possibility of an implantable prevention opportunity, which means people will only need to take their PrEP once a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, these truly are game-changing kinds of innovations. Um, but at the heart of it, it is still about human beings and human behavior. And so, you know, I think we still need to do a lot more work about understanding stigma key populations, how they see themselves in the world, how our health systems interact with the key populations. These are the things that are going to get us to the end of AIDS. Um, and so, you know, the, the message is it's we do still need to do more of what we know we need to do. And we can look forward to the new things that are coming on the horizon that I think will move us forward in extraordinary ways. On top of all of this, we are going to need ongoing funding for a long time. And so, you know, I think the world needs to refocus again on the fact that the HIV epidemic is far from over. I'm afraid the 2020 targets are not going to be reached. Um, we can work very hard for 2030 and hope to get as close as we can. But the end of AIDS is still a very, very far way away or the HIV epidemic at least. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to pull up the socks and keep moving forward. And as you said, that the funding will be a problem and also putting the funds in the right places. Uh, you mentioned uh, preventing mother-to-child transmission. So I think all those have to be part of the HIV prevention strategy and um, targeting people, not just the virus, perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, getting, I, I think the other thing that I feel frustrated about is we need to finish some of the tasks we've set. You know, I think we have had a good, we've had a reasonable report card. Yes, Those, yes. the goals we've made through the years, we've, if we haven't quite made it, we've come very close. I think 2020 is going to be the first time that the report card isn't looking so good, but those were ambitious targets. Um, we have got almost 24 million people on treatment around the world. That's extraordinary. Um, we've got probably half a million people on PrEP, so there's work to be done there. And as I say, we've got mother to child tantalizingly close. We just have to finish the job. And the last few miles are always difficult to achieve, Linda. The last mile is always the hardest. It is the hardest, yes. Thank you very much, Linda. Friends, in this episode of CNS Dialogues for Sustainable Development, we were listening to Dr. Linda Gelbecker, Deputy Director, Desmond Tutu HIV Center, Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine, University of Cape Town, South Africa, on site from the 20th International Conference on AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Infections in Africa, taking place in Rwanda. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, so much. thank you. Good. Great. I'm glad to have helped. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Take care.